Sales growth may be slowing, but compare it to most countries in the developed world and there is little to complain. The economy has been on a rising trajectory, boosted by the demands of its people, and even now, it's consumption that is driving every segment of the Indian economy. But even as India grows, it has to ensure that it plans for the future. For instance, by 2020, we will need an additional 70,000 kilometers of roads, 25,000 kilometers of new railway lines, 30 million units of houses, another 160 gigawatts of power. And we are far from it. That is why concerted efforts are being taken to put together the key building blocks for India's future. Take for example the big urban development plan under the government-run JNNURM. The 60,000 crore rupee initiative was launched by the government to tackle the challenges brought in by the rapid growth of urbanization and encourage private participation in the development of our cities. It is estimated that over 140 million people will move into our cities by 2020 and this number will only increase. In fact, to handle this population influx, the government has launched several projects across cities with four basic focus areas housing, roads, urban transport and sewage disposal and ensuring that clean drinking water is available to all its residents. And as citizen group Janagraha's co-founder Ramesh Ravanathan says, there has been progress made, though a lot more needs to be done. Uh, the way I would look at Jain and URM is that, you know, you can call it the good, the bad and the ugly. The good news is that it has made urban relevant for the first time. When we began making the case for an urban intervention of a large scale in 2004, there was no appetite for uh, anything like this. The dominant thinking in Delhi and uh, other policy circles was India is still predominantly a rural country. I think what JNNURM has done is to change that uh, conversation. And so now there is a complete acceptance that urban is important and urban is complex and Urban is different from rural, which means we need different kinds of responses. But where JNNURM has not been able to adapt, at least yet, is we've discovered lots of gaps, the capacity gaps. There are lots of challenges in terms of technical capabilities, manpower and so on in city governments, which is where the front line of this change is going to happen. How are we going to address those gaps in a way that is urgent? I think that's not yet happened. What JNNURM has successfully done is that it has got a lot of private sector companies interested in this sector. But to ensure that our cities are ready for the growth we will see in them, private players point out that while there is opportunity, a lot more needs to be done. What we see is that uh, there is a lot of opportunity in this space and, and some of the, uh, I think government has taken cognizance of this uh, uh, demand and aspirations our demand on the urban infra space. Some of the schemes of Jain and Yorium uh, are helping, but, there, that, but more, can be do, more can be done in the space of uh, urban transportation, uh, in the space of uh, water, in, in the space of solid waste and management, and in terms of uh, in more social infrastructure like having a better, um, you say that uh, open spaces like parks and gardens. So this number of opportunities are there. If private companies are looking ahead at the opportunity to build up our cities, companies in the healthcare sector seem to be taking the lead in using technology to go deep into India. And here, the partnership between the public sector and private enterprise has worked. Take Apollo Hospitals, which has been working with the government and using high-end technology to make healthcare more accessible in rural areas. It has opened a series of telemedicine centers like this, which help rural patients connect to specialists via satellites. Apollo Hospital's Preeta Reddy explains how technology can help the problems on the ground. We've worked with them in Tamil Nadu, you know, with TCS, Asha, Apollo, we've worked together, and they've got the palm tops. So a lot of the messages are going back, a hub and spoke model, there's a central station, it's, you know, it's giving answers back. And I think this is a model when perfected that not only India will use, but the rest of the world will, em will emulate. And then there's the whole M-Health platform, you know, the penetration of mobile uh, telephone users 
is like, uh, you know, millions, more than 50% of the country have some access or the other. If you can just plug it into a mobile triaging system, just a health triaging system, so many answers are left. You know, on one side, we're still grappling with infant mortality. But you know, if a pregnant woman can actually be told, this, 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 go to your nearest uh, public health center. So to me, healthcare has to be, you know, there are three Ps in it. It has to be preventive, it has to be participatory, and then move to, be an, move to being predictive. If Apollo is taking healthcare inside India where the real problem is, Devi Shetty and his award-winning organization is saving hundreds of lives each day by taking high-end healthcare mass. We believe that in India, if you want to transform the way the healthcare is delivered, you have to concentrate on the number. I'll give an example. India has to do 2.5 million heart surgeries a year. And we are currently doing all the heart hospitals in the country put together, only about 90,000 heart surgeries. When are you going to reach that number? How many 200 bed hospital you need to build to reach that number? So we have to really look at a different model. If healthcare is making inroads into India, new roads are enabling development to seep into the rural landscape. In fact, after the build-up of almost 42,000 kilometers of highways between 2002 and now, the new focus seems to be in creating a new framework of rural roads by 2020. And a lot more needs to be done here. Another important vertical of connectivity that needs to be focused upon are airports. In early 2000, the government realized the importance of modernization of airports and opened up the sector for private players. Following this, we have seen the transformation of Mumbai, Delhi, Hyderabad and Bangalore as important hubs with world-class infrastructure. But even though these airports have accelerated growth in these cities, this is just a small slice of what needs to be done. India will need about 50 more greenfield airports by 2020. 33 of our airports in smaller cities don't have night landing facilities and are in a non-operational condition. Over 40% don't have hangars for aircraft maintenance and all of this will need an estimated investment of $40 billion. We require $40 billion by next, next um, 15 years up to 2025. Uh, and and uh, if you include the surface access and cost of surface access infrastructure, uh, then I think you would can add another 30, 40 billion dollars. So between the surface access infrastructure and airport infrastructure, the requirement is 70, 80 billion, and this real, it's 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 going to hit our face very soon. One of the big problems with India's infrastructure build-up has been the fact that development has been in fits and starts. And while there have been successes, what we need is consistency and acceleration in the implementation of new projects to meet the demand of a fast-growing nation. In fact, apart from the policy clarity, one factor that could help us do this is finance. Today, about 40% of infrastructure projects have been stalled or delayed because of a shortage of funds. More on that when we return.